like the maybe I just watched it. Good evening, everyone. I would like to call the Monday, March 11th school committee meeting to order here at the Colbert School. Um, at this point, we're going to go right into the public information session. So there's a process we need to follow, and uh, I will um, share the process, and then I will open it up to the school committee if they have any questions, and then I will open it up to the uh, people that are here tonight to um, make statements based on their nominees. So with that, at this time, I would like to request a motion to open the public information session for the consideration of names for the new early education center. So moved. I have a motion by Dr. Horak. Second. And a second by Ms. Tuffy. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we are now in the public hearing. So again, I'm just gonna give a little background about uh, how we got here. Um, so, this is really the first time um, that we've been naming a school or renaming a school in probably about 25 years. We renamed um, the, the Lakeside School, I believe in the middle 90s uh, to the Mary E. Flaherty School. And this is also the first time that we'll be using our new policy, um, FF naming facilities, um, since it was adopted by the school committee. Um, you know, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, we have gymnasiums, auditoriums, media centers, the guidance suite at um, BHS and outdoor classrooms that are all been dedicated to individuals who have made an impact uh, or a significant contribution to the Braintree Public Schools. Uh, we also have four elementary schools that have been named for individuals. The Mary E. Flaherty School, which I've re referred to, she was a longtime principal at the Lakeside School. The Norton Eugene Hollis, who was a historical figure. Uh, Archie T. Morrison, who was a longtime school committee member and Donald E. Ross, who was a teacher and a first lieutenant in the army who was killed in action in 1944. So this is a very rare opportunity for us to honor an individual who has made a significant impact to the Braintree, to Braintree and in particular to the Braintree Public Schools. So this is a process so far. So back in our February 5th school committee meeting, we outlined the procedure under policy FF naming facilities to request suggestions for names uh, from residents for the Early Education Center and what we're all uh, now referring to as the Old South. Um, in accordance with the policy, submission of the names needed to be made by residents in writing to me, the school committee chair. A notice was published in the Patriot Ledger as well as a numerous social media pages, um, as well as on the town website. We established a four week submission period and that ended last Monday, March 4th. I received nearly a hundred written requests for a total of nine different individuals detailing their contributions to society and in particular the Braintree Public Schools. The letters range from simple a simple name, just I'm nominating so-and-so, um, to very thoughtful, heartfelt letters and everything in between. So again, I would like to thank all the people that took the time to write a letter and to reach out um, with their nominees. There are a number of restrictions under the policy that we must abide by. Consideration will be given no sooner than five years from the end of service to the community. And in the case of a deceased individual, a full five year wait period is required from the date of death. After reviewing all of the nominees, these procedures limited us from considering three of the nominees. William Verasso, also known as Officer Bill, and Laurie Melchionda, who both passed in 2020. And Jeffrey Rubin, who was our former SPED director, who retired in 2022. I also received a request for Captain Peterson. However, there was no detail outlining his contribution specifically to bring to public schools. I think we're all familiar with his generous gift uh, and his final wishes. The remaining five nominees in alphabetical order are Joseph A. Desario, Sergeant Frederick Follett, Dr. Peter A. Kersberg, T. Michael Molongoski, and Thomas A. Watson. Tonight's public information session gives the opportunity for the public to speak on behalf of their nominees and to share their uh, contributions with the full committee. We will not be voting tonight. This is just to gather information. The committee will take in, into consideration the statements made tonight, as well as information shared through the letters uh, received. So, and I anticipate the vote will take place on March 25th. Uh, we will put that on the agenda for the March 25th meeting. So with that, 
Um, if there are any questions or comments from the committee before we invite up our uh, our residents to, to uh, talk about their nominees. Are there any questions or comments from the committee at this point? None. Seeing none? Okay. And then I will open it up to the public. So, um, Mr. Verasso. Thank you for letting me come here and speak about- Could I ask you to just sit at the I'm... desk? Could I ask you to just sit right there? There's a microphone. Sit, can you sit, please? Sorry, <laughs> if you don't mind. Just so we can pick up your voice on the microphone. Thank you for coming to the committee for considering my brother for this honorable thing, uh, naming Officer Bill at the South School. I understand you have a policy in naming school buildings and you stand by it as you should. And some votes are more difficult to make. I'm aware of what you're faced with because I was once on the school committee myself and in the 70s. I had to vote on closing four schools. A parent came up to me and asked me if I hated children. So I told her, naturally, no, I have six of my own. So that was it. So I know what you're going through. Thank you. And uh, I just hope Officer Bill will be remembered as a Purple Heart veteran, mostly what he instilled on young minds. The young kids loved him. When he was coming to the school, they were all excited. And he loved them, too. He taught them the respect for all people. And after he retired from the police, he went on another direction with seniors. He went from the younger to the older and volunteered morning at the nursing home, royal nurse, nurse excuse me, morning royal nursing home, and in the afternoon at the Pope nursing home. I just hope he is not forgotten. So I want to thank you for allowing me to come here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I will share the letters. I did receive a number of letters on your brother's behalf, and I will share the letters with the committee and with Mayor Joyce. So thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Diane Desario. Hachi? Hachi. Hachi. Good evening, Madam Mayor, <clears throat> Madam Chair, and School Committee. My name is Diane Desario Hashi, and I'm here on behalf of my dad. I was unable to nominate him um, because I'm not a resident now. I, I grew up in Braintree, went through the school system. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Salamini, um, Officer Salamini, nominated him. So, like you said, you're sharing that with everybody. Um, he has a wide array of <clears throat> qualifications. He was the principal for 23 years early childhood education at the Morrison, the Colbert, um, and the Innovatory School in Braintree. He had several civil, um, the Alps, the veterans, he worked in the church. He had, I'm sure, like I said, should share that with you. Um, but as his daughter, I mean, everyone, I wanted to put a personal spin on it. Everybody says their dad's great. Um, I've had so many people since he's passed and he's been gone a while come to me and say, all I can remember about your dad is his beautiful smile. Um, he was, he greeted the children every morning at school, regardless of the weather. And he said goodbye to them at the end of the day. Um, the teachers loved him. The students to this day still say things to me about it. Um, so if you, I would respectfully request that you would make this <clears throat> name the old South middle school after him it would be an honor, and I would really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry, I can't read the first name. For Dr. K, for Dr. Kersberg. Joe. Joe. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> Thank you for the break, by the way. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, and uh, good evening, members of the school committee, Mayor Joyce. My name is Joe Oliver, and I'm here to make a nomination for the naming of the new Early Education Center. My wife, Jane, and I would like to nominate Dr. Peter Kersberg. Jane and I have three daughters who attended Braintree Public Schools. Not only did they receive a wonderful, nurturing education, they were extremely well prepared to go on to further education. This was during Dr. Kersberg's tenure as superintendent, and it's fair to say 
His reputation speaks for itself in this regard. As far as Dr. Kersberg being a leader within the community, I know of many instances where he encouraged parents like us to step up and get more involved within the town. Through his encouragement and vision, he helped us create a recreation program, Super Saturdays, for special needs students in Braintree. This unique program, now in its 27th year, started with 20 students and now services over 65 families. This would not have been happening without the leadership of Dr. Kersberg. Today, Super Saturdays has become the model for many surrounding communities. This is just one example of Dr. Kersberg's many contributions, enhancing the quality of life and education for the students and families of Braintree. For this and many other examples of dedication to our town, we would like to nominate the naming of the new Early Education Center to be named in honor of Dr. Peter Kersberg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. McDonald. <clears throat> to the members of the Braintree School Committee, my name is Tim McDonald. I'm a Braintree resident and the father of former and current Braintree students, and I've been the principal of Hollis School for 20 years now. Prior to that, I was a teacher at Hollis. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to share my thoughts regarding the naming of this new Early Childhood Learning Center. I also would like to recognize all the nominees who are being considered for this honor, specifically Mr. Joseph Desario. I had the brief opportunity to work with Mr. Desario when he provided an interim support for a principal who was on medical leave of absence. I found Mr. Desario to be exactly as he'd been described to me by many members of the Braintree Schools community, a true gentleman, a man of his word, and a joy to work with. But at this time, I'd like to formally recommend the new Early Education Center to be named in honor of Dr. Peter Kersberg, our former superintendent of schools. Dr. Kersberg served an extraordinary 22 years as our superintendent of schools. He led with compassion, integrity, strong character, and a deep level of care for our school system, our students, and our staff. During his tenure, Dr. Kersberg led hundreds of initiatives that focused on improving our school system. When discussions occurred about new programs or ideas, Dr. Kersberg always asked us the same question. How will this improve student achievement? This was his main focus, but not his sole focus. He always recognized the importance of students and staff's well-being and creating strong relationships with students, families, and our Braintree community. Dr. Kersberg's presence was everywhere. In his time as superintendent, he was extremely visible in our schools in the town of Braintree, whether it was a theater production, an art show, an athletic contest, or the hundreds of staff members' retirement parties that he somehow found the time to get to, Peter Kersberg was there. This presence created a true family feeling in our school and our rather large school system. Staff members will recall how, we, how one could expect a congratulatory, congratulatory card in the mail after getting married or having a new addition to the family. And many will recall the shock upon seeing him align at a wake of a loved one. Good, happy, or solemn times, Dr. K showed up. Peter Kersberg was there. He never saw his role as a superintendent as a nine to five job. Instead, he strove to build a community within the Braintree school system where things like loyalty, hard work, and devotion were rewarded and recognized. Although he retired years ago, Dr. Kersberg had a brief stint as an interim superintendent in Braintree when our district was in need of short-term leadership. As was the case again, Peter Kersberg showed up for Braintree. As a district administrator, the most important lesson Dr. Kersberg taught me was the importance of hiring staff. He routinely told me that hiring staff is the most important aspect of your job. I've taken this to heart and tried to hire people who will strive to emulate the loyalty, professionalism, competence, and love for Braintree that Peter Kersberg demonstrated during his 22 years as our superintendent. I believe this is one of his many lasting legacies. It's exciting in Braintree to have this opportunity to name a building after someone. It's exciting to think that we could get to recognize the work of a person like Peter Kersberg, who has given so much, so much to so many. He is a man who truly deserves this honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. <clears throat> uh, Donna Anderson.
My name is Donna Anderson, and I am honored to serve as the principal of the Manadequit School Kindergarten Center presently in our 10th year. Prior to that, I was a full-day kindergarten teacher in Braintree's first full-day kindergarten program, FDK at BHS. I am a longtime early childhood educator in Braintree, first hired in 1994, and I can hardly wait to serve as Braintree as principal of Braintree soon to be early elementary center. It is my pleasure to speak with you tonight about my suggestion for the naming of Braintree's early elementary center already in the works at the location presently and lovingly referred to as Old South. Braintree is incredibly fortunate to benefit from the contributions of many inspiring individuals that make Braintree such an awesome place in which to live and work. That being said, in my mind, there is one most logical choice of an individual to be recognized for their impactful and inspiring work with Braintree's youngest learners, and that individual is Dr. Peter Allen Kersberg. As you may be aware, Dr. Kersberg served as superintendent of the Braintree Public Schools from July 1991 through June 2013, an incredible 22 years, and interim superintendent from July through September 2015. Prior to Braintree, Dr. Kersberg served as an assistant superintendent, special education director, and special education teacher. He was president of the Braintree Rotary and has been for some time and is currently the president of Temple B'nai Shalom. A pillar of our community, Dr. Kersberg's years of service, varied roles and contributions are beyond compare. But it is not only for this reason that I, along with several others, feel that an early elementary center in particular should be named in his honor. At the risk of not doing Dr. Kersberg justice, I will tell you why. Undoubtedly, most people in this room and all around Braintree have some connection to Dr. K. To say he is a role model is an understatement. A father figure to his BPS staff, Dr. K is, by extension, a beloved grandfather figure to our students, most especially our littlest learners. I have fond memories of Dr. K visiting my half-day kindergarten classroom a while ago at Hollis School, grinning wide and listening intently as the students there recited the names of the American presidents. The students beamed with pride when Dr. Kersberg asked, who's smarter than a kindergartner? Meanwhile, Dr. Kersberg was at the forefront of planning for Braintree's first full-day kindergarten program, which families advocated for at the time. He met individually with parents, hosted lengthy group meetings, transformed an unlikely learning space at Braintree High School, and collaborated to make full-day kindergarten the reality he envisioned in 2011. Full-day kindergarten was housed at Braintree High School for three years, and prior to his retirement in June of 2013, it was striking that Dr. Kersberg was accessible, quick to address needs, and welcomed any opportunity to visit our young learners and staff. He did not hesitate to sit in our tiny chairs and dine on kindergarten pizza during a meeting and mostly smile due to the evident joy he felt in observing and chatting with our young students learning and growing together. Due to the success of Dr. K's full day kindergarten program, it grew to fill the Manadequit School Kindergarten Center in 2014. Dr. Kersberg had worked and planned for this project before his retirement and further supported MSKC in the role of interim superintendent in 2015. As you may imagine, most visitors to a kindergarten center tend to delight in the enthusiasm and energy of our five and six-year-olds. However, no visitor smiles quite as wide or chats quite as long as Dr. K, who takes sincere interest in everything he sees and inquires as to what is needed, if anything. In the past 10 years, Dr. Kersberg has attended almost as many special events, hoot nannies, and year-end awards assemblies at MSKC as I have, sometimes clad in a bright royal blue sunshiny MSKC t-shirt, and all is right with the world when he is in our presence. It is a comfort to know that Dr. Kersberg continues to support our schools, students, staff, families, and community in his retirement, and his contributions and inspiration mean more than he will ever know. Due to Dr. Kersberg's vision, inspiration, dedication, connection, contributions, support, presence, and sheer joy for early childhood education, I, along with several others, propose that Braintree's Early Elementary Center be named the Dr. Peter Allen Kersberg Early Elementary Center, and I hope that you agree. Is there anybody else who didn't sign up? No? All right. Um, since we didn't have anybody here for Sergeant Frederick Follett, I will just uh, let the committee know that he uh, attended South Middle School. He is a 1965 graduate of Braintree High School. He was in the 116th Assault Helicopter Company as a, as a crew chief, and he um, was killed in action in 1969. 
in the Republic of South Vietnam. And T. Michael Molinowski, I know I, I always have a difficult time with Molinowski, um, was our former um, assistant superintendent. So again, I, oh, and Thomas Watson um, is credited with um, creating the very first kindergarten in Braintree in the 1890s, as well as um, being uh, a huge supporter of education. Um, so again, I have letters from all of these um, nominees, and I will share that information with the committee. And again, um, we expect to vote on March 25th. Is there any other questions or comments from the committee before I ask to close the public hearing? Seeing none, uh, may I have a, a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. I have a motion by Dr. Horak. Second. Second by Ms. Tuffy. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. The public hearing is now closed. Thank you all who came to to share their statements. We're gonna go into the rest of our agenda. So you're by all means, you're, uh, you can leave if you'd like to leave for the evening. Um, I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate um, all the nominations and we will keep you posted on our progress. So thank you again. Okay, uh, moving on um, to public comments. I have one name, Ashley Stedman. I should come up to the mic. Right there. Exactly. Uh, Ashley Stedman, 51 Weston Ave. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Lee, Assistant Superintendent Renaza, members of the school committee, and Mayor Joyce. On behalf of a number of concerned Braintree families, we are politely asking you to consider changing the town's position on a homeschool kindergarten class for Hollis Elementary School. I gathered numerous families who are currently in the same circumstances of having older siblings at Hollis with an incoming kindergartner. We were all at a loss as to how we will make the next school year work and disappointed that our children will be separated from their siblings because of the poor planning by the town. It is an unreasonable expectation to ask working families in the Hollis School District to perform the dual transport of their kindergartners to Peach Street and their older children to their home schools. We are expected to be in two vastly different locations at the same time. The situation is logistically untenable. Numerous families have emailed our leadership and responses have been inconsistent, dissatisfying, inconsiderate, and some have fallen flat with no response. For instance, we've been told to register for the bus. It is no secret that not only is this town of Braintree having difficulty filling bus driver positions, but we are in a budget deficit and cannot afford these drivers nor the buses themselves. We've asked for bus schedules and routes so that families can problem solve, and we have received empty responses from our leadership. We've been told, and I quote, families have made it work by putting some or all of their children on the bus or carpooling with neighbors. This seems to be a callous and inconsiderate response. In order to make such a proposal functional and accessible, there would need to be considerable planning and support to account for the number of practical concerns that have been raised by families who have full-time working parents, such as bus times and routes. Having support in these critical areas from the town is essential for them to work. We have asked for this information and you have not, cannot give it to us. In addition to the previous response, we've been given the option to drop one student off early and one late. This is not a feasible solution for a number of reasons. Firstly, we are being asked to accept less than that for which we have paid by losing class time, which is unacceptable and unfair. Secondly, Suggesting that we remove our children from school and miss out on time on learning because the town cannot figure out a better answer does not seem to be an adequate solution based on DESE's standards, nor is it equitable. I believe this is why Manadequit Kindergarten Center changed its start time last year. Why is our leadership suddenly allowing this to happen? The town is in a budget deficit. Families do not want to be forced to put their kindergartners on buses. Let's save the town some money and make this kindergarten classroom possible. Having a kindergarten class at Hollis would relieve the requirement of an additional bus, which will presumably save money for the town and alleviate the unrealistic expectations on our families. Hollis has the space. My eldest is currently a third grader and over her years at Hollis, I've witnessed teacher after teacher being forced to move to a different building as part of the Band-Aid solutions this town is becoming notorious for. Due to this, there are currently many empty classrooms at Hollis. If the kindergarten program at Hollis is removed, an entire floor of classrooms will be empty. Every teacher, including all the specialists, have their own classrooms. Hollis does not need more empty classrooms. It needs a kindergarten program and families. 
Not only do we have concerns about the logistics of this operation, but we also have concerns for our children's social and emotional development. One of the noted benefits of having a kindergarten class at Hollis is the additional support the children receive from having older siblings, friends, and neighbors within the school. This additional support is invaluable to their experience and it is being unnecessarily squandered with this current plan. This is an especially frustrating situation because it seems to be a short-sighted measure with little to no consideration for the impact it has on families and children within the schools. This was not the appeal upon which Braintree Public Schools have historically established its reputation. This is a disappointing and seemingly avoidable set of circumstances that has burdened a number of Braintree families with unnecessary difficulty in imposition. Leadership responded to this concern by saying, and I quote, the decision to move all kindergarten sections to Old South is driven by the desire to have all students receive a consistent and age appropriate introduction to school, both involving the curriculum they experience and the instruction they receive. This response is misguided. Logic would dictate that students of different age groups and grade levels are not consolidated in one place in the district. If equitable education is a concern, this is more of an issue of how professional development is done in this town and not a location issue. Such a circumstance will dramatically and unnecessarily shift routines within the household of affected families. This policy change seems to be ill-conceived, poorly communicated, and unreceptive to feedback and criticism, and thus an unnecessary and unhealthy detriment to the students. Leadership responded to this concern by saying, although it appears this structure for kindergarten is not aligned with your current expectations, we are confident that your daughter and all our kindergarten students will have an excellent experience at South. This is a glib response that oversimplifies a challenging circumstance for many families. Undue stress and anxiety are not conducive to providing children with an excellent experience. For a genuine concern to be raised and to be received with such a thoughtless response in characterization is unbecoming of Braintree Public Schools. Historically, Braintree families have enjoyed the privilege of choice in whether their children attend the kindergarten center. If such a privilege is to be withheld by the town, which is its prerogative, it should be communicated efficiently and well in advance, which is not true for this particular policy change. This decision compromises the goodwill and spirit of cooperation between Braintree families and the school committee. Please reconsider your position. Think about the unnecessary stress you're putting on working families who are asking us to do the impossible. Think about the money the town will save by eliminating an additional bus route as well as other numerous cost benefits. Think about the children and what is best for them. These children look up to their older siblings and they need a stronger sense of community as a foundational support in their development. Families, families moved to a particular neighborhood and chose the Hollis School District because we all planned on having our children at Hollis Elementary School together. Please correct this problematic policy. It does not cost the town anything. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? No? Anybody online? Want no, uh, yeah, one person. Hold on. Uh, we have John Cass. Mr. Cass, can you hear me? Okay. He's muted. Okay. He hasn't raised his hand. He raised his hand. I, it, it, it's on his side. Uh, Hello, Cass can you hear me? Can you hear Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Hi, how is everybody? I hope you're all well this evening after this uh, warm day, but uh, uh, cold winds, uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, windy. So, what I wanted to bring up was uh, a school building assessment. Um, I think it would be really important, especially after. Um, you know the uh, the situation where we had two roofs fall off. Uh, the boiler uh, not working at the high school, and then of course that incident in in 2021 where um, uh, the high school didn't open for over a week, and uh, uh, that was because uh, the electrical room was flooded, which apparently uh, had happened about 10 or 15 years before, and uh, the problem hadn't been uh, resolved uh, strategically; it had just been fixed uh, uh, in a reactive way. So, so currently we have a lot of um, uh, uh, school building issues. You know, uh, we. Um, uh, you know, we've got old uh, school building stock going back to Hollis and uh, Highlands, 1912, 1930. And it hadn't been for 50 years that we'd built another uh, school and we just built one. So I think we're making progress, but we've got a lot of work to do. And I and I do understand. I do understand that we're in Massachusetts and we have Prop 2.5 and, and we have that problem. But I think there are ways that we can 
do an assessment of all the schools. And I think most people, at least that what I've seen online, is that they would say that the uh, Braintree High School is the first one to address. But I don't know if that's the case. And the reason is, is because we I don't think we've got a good understanding as a town, uh, whether that's the school committee, um, the public works department, of exactly what the problems are. And so I think what we need to do is do a school building assessment uh, to understand what those issues are. We could use an outside consulting company. I look at Dedham and I look at Canton. If you go there, they're small school districts. Uh, they've had them for 10 or, or five years and, and they spent you know, money using outside consultants. But actually we have a software program that we use for repair within the school systems. It's called School du Dude. Uh, it got bought out by Brightly uh, and um, it's a system that's actually used by uh, the city of Boston as well and other school districts uh, around the state of Massachusetts. That school repair appli uh, application allows uh, folks in the school district to put in requests for repair. And the changeover from the uh, school district maintenance staff to uh, the town maintenance staff has, of course, improved uh, the uh, the repair uh, rate and also scheduled work. We only we have eleven people working on a school repair, and we've got one person working on scheduled repair. And and the issue I think is this, which is that we have two modules. We've got the school repair, we've got the repair uh, module, and then we have a scheduled um, uh, maintenance repair. And what we need to do is to put every single piece of equipment and plan in that system so that we can get an idea of what the current status is of scheduled maintenance across uh, the district. I think what we also need, and I encourage the committee and also the school district, the town council and the mayor to look at this, is to uh, put in a capital planning uh, system using that software. So I, I've spoken many, many times and written and asked for a school building a, a assessment. And I still would like to see that. But I think what's more important is we just give the, the public works department the resources and the money for an application that they can use uh, to get an assessment of every school building so that we can understand where we are and we can make long-term decisions. I'm not even suggesting that we fix everything, but rather we have that system. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was that. Okay. All right. So we'll move into the routine matters. Uh, approval of open session meeting minutes from February 5th, 2024, and from February 27th, 24. So uh, moved. I have a motion by Dr. Horak. Second. And a second by Ms. Tuffy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. Uh, moving on to communications and accommodations, Superintendent Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, I only have a couple this evening. One is in your packet. It is a program being presented by Bashi called Screenagers. Some information from um, our Director of uh, Physical Education and Health, Melanie Bennett, on a, a program available to families within the town that's upcoming. Uh, the other um, is to make you aware, if you are not already, that uh, Earlier today, Tara Boning, principal of Liberty Elementary School, uh, notified uh, her parent community that she will be resigning at the end of the year. She's moving to another community. She actually has moved physically to another community. She will now be working in that community. Uh, she notified her staff on Friday, uh, and we will begin putting together a process for her replacement, but just to make you aware of that. And at this point, that is all I have for this evening. Thank you for that. We wish her luck. She will be missed. Um, moving into gifts to schools, um, I will make, I will read all through and I'll ask for one motion for approval. Uh, Braintree High School, uh, gifts to school $300 from Milton store for the 2024 credit for life fair. Uh, Braintree High School science department, one check in the amount of $363 and 60 cents from the Flaherty PTO to the science department for solar eclipse glasses. South middle school gifts to schools totaling $10,187. Three deposits in the amount of $1,250, $2,202, and $1,505 for the South Middle School Washington, D.C. trip, and one deposit in the amount of $5,230 for the South Middle School ski trip. East Middle School gifts to schools totaling $14,190, one deposit in the amount of $500 from the ExxonMobil Corporation General Global Donation 
account, one deposit in the amount of $13,325 from the ski snowboard trip, one deposit in the amount of $40 from the yearbook, and one deposit in the amount of $325 from the grade seven field trip. Islands Elementary School gifts to schools totally $969.25 from the Highlands PTO to be used by the Highlands School to improve the academic and social opportunities of all students at Highlands. District-wide, City of Quincy South Coastal Career Development Administration gifts to school for $8,000, one check in the amount of $8,000 for the FY24 DESE Connecting Activities. And then Bay State Textiles uh, gifts totaling $531.30. Do I have a motion to accept all? So moved. I have a motion by Dr. Horak. Second. Second by Ms. Tuffy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Moving on to trip approval. Thank you again. So in your packet, you have a request from East Middle School to attend the Trills and Thrills Festival in New Hampshire. Uh, this is something we have done almost annually in my tenure in the central office here. Uh, they go up uh, to Nashua and perform, and then at the end, they go to Canopy Lake Parks. It is a routine trip that we take, but it is in New Hampshire, so we request your approval. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on the trip? Seeing none. Is there a motion? Motion. My Dr. Herrick. Second. Excuse me. And Ms. Tuffy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Uh, moving on to administrative updates. Back to you, Superintendent Lee, for the kindergarten registration update. Uh, just to keep everybody updated in ter terms of where our numbers are, as of today, we have 310 students registered for either full day or half day. Uh, of that number, 287 are registered for full day, and at this point, 23 are registered for half day. Uh, there's been some movement in these numbers uh, since the last time I reported it, but some of that is internal. Uh, many of our kindergarten age students will go to special programs uh, as they get kind of placed into that schedule. They come out of the overall portion for full day because it's part of our special education program. Uh, but the numbers are in line with last year, um, and so we're still on track with that. Uh, and we still have a little bit of ways to go in terms of registration. Are there any questions from the committee on the kin kindergarten? Registration update, Ms. Tuffy. Are we um, still offering uh, some scholarships for uh, low-income students so they can attend school day kindergarten? We do have some scholarship money that is available that we have been um, providing to families. Uh, it is a limited pool of money uh, that comes to us from some benefactors outside the district, but yes, we have. Any other questions or comments on kindergarten? No, nope, see none. Okay. All right. So we're moving on to from the committee. Uh, student representatives, thoughts. So as far as my update, we do have a spirit week coming up next week called Stand Up Week. And I know a lot of after school clubs and activities made banners on sheets that will be hanging up in the gym foyer. There are, are some from a couple of years ago that are there right now, but I know a lot of clubs are updating them. I know I've made one. They're quite a lot of work, but they're going to look really nice. So I'm really excited about that. And just the whole Spirit Week next week, the pep rally at the end of the week, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then Sam could not be here tonight, but she wanted to express a little bit of concern that she had. And also I heard around the student body last week during the elections, just the fact that we heard a lot from a lot of students like, wait, anybody can kind of just walk in the school, like the doors being open and kind of just there was some concern surrounding that, you know, is, are we going to know who's coming in, who's coming out all the time? Because obviously that's not the way the school usually operates. So just some concern that I heard. Anyway. And the schools will be closed in November for election day. This was a unique case. Yes. I, yeah. Um, okay. So I have a couple of things. The first thing was um, two weekends ago, Theater Guild performed at Framingham High School for the Massachusetts um, Theater Guild Festival. We did not move on, but I am very proud of us because we won four awards. We won the stage manager award, which to put it simply means that we got the nicest school award, which is awesome. We've always wondered why we haven't gotten it in the past. Um, and I'm so proud of everyone on the tech crew. We also got three acting achievement awards. I'm really proud of the work that we put in. This is the first year that we did feel like it was a little bit of a fair competition because of um, the self-funding that Braintree Theater Guild has competing with other schools can be a little bit of a challenge when you notice the lack of funding that 
um, we do have. Um, anyways, um, a couple of other things. This past Saturday was the um, first SATs for sec uh, for juniors. It was hosted at Ranger High. I did not take it. I heard that it was very difficult. Um, secondly, I know that there is a Naviance workshop this um, this Thursday for high school juniors to go meet with their guidance counselors. And we're basically going to be over a little bit more of the college admission process. Okay, that's all for me. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about Intra Club. So I was out for a few weeks, but I am back. Um, and so far, the Intra Club, while I was gone, and was working on um, a fundraiser to support not only our club, but also like a local organization. So now we're selling chocolates for that. Um, and this past week, we had a lunch with the Rotary organization. So Intra Partners partners up with the road organization and every year um, the officers go either to the town hall or um, sometimes at the library and we just post like a lunch so we meet with the rotary members and kind of discuss what we do um, because rotary helps fund interact so we talk about what we've been doing this year um, and then also as Maddie said spirit week everyone's kind of looking forward to that I know seniors who have a credit for life um, event next week and then um, Friday we're gonna have, we have some dances and I think it'll be like a nice break for everyone. So, Spirit Week, what are the days? Blue and white. <laughs> I know Colors of Your Country is one. Yes. I know Pride, like um, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus Pride is a day. Pink for Kindness, Friday. What's the, what's the, is, is, are we doing colors? <laughs> oh, Superhero Day. Okay. okay. Superhero Day. <laughs> Superhero I don't even know what's next week. Superhero it's Thursday. <laughs> Glad she told you it was next week. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, looking forward. We did get an invitation. The school committee got an invitation to uh, attend the Credit for Life as well. So I'm going to try to make an, an appearance. I haven't been able to go for a few years just because of work conflicts, but I'd really like to go this year. So hopefully my uh, my peers will join me and hope to see you all there. Um, yeah. Thank you, as always, my my uh, highlight of the, of the meeting. So thank you all. Any questions or comments from the committee about the student reports? Okay, great. Oh, sure. Uh, is Spirit Week just in the high school? Or is that in the other well, the school? It's in high school. Yes. They have other like have other days. Ones. They have other theme days at the other schools. Yeah. But the Spirit Week's been there in high school. So you get the high school perspective. Understood. Yeah. Great. Good question. All right. Um, so we're moving on to the valuation uh, subcommittee update. So I'm going to give a high level uh, update as we did meet on March 5th, um, Dr. Horak, Ms. Tuffy and I make up the subcommittee for the evaluation, uh, superintendent evaluation. Um, we voted unanimously um, to move forward um, an additional goal for the superintendent. Um, I think you have it in your packet. So it is district improvement goal number three, to prepare the FY25 budget in collaboration with the mayor's office to communicate budget options with families and community stakeholders. The, the committee voted 3-0 to move this forward to the full committee for um, for uh, your consideration. Um, also, I'd like to commend Ms. Tuffy. She's done quite a bit of work on this, uh, on the forms themselves. So she, um, we're simplifying the evaluation form to include only the focus indicators that relate to the goals. I think there's over 100 indicators, or this, maybe I'm exaggerating, but there's quite a few indicators, but we've simplified the form so it only includes the indicators that are related to the to the four goals. Um, we're also suggesting each one of the school committee members has a one-on-one -on -one with the superintendent um, to fill out um, their specific evaluation form. And then um, I will collect and summarize the committee's comments uh, and feedback uh, for a formalized assessment that we have right now tentatively scheduled for March 25th, if, if everyone can get their one-on-one -on -one before that and are prepared. That is the date, March 25th, um, that we will do the formative assessments. We also updated the, the um, ratings, I guess you'd call them, to pending some progress and significant progress. There were some other readings on their form that comes from DESE that we did not think were ne uh, necessarily appropriate. So we did make those changes again. Um, and again, I want to uh, thank um, Ms. Tuffy for all of her work on the forms. Um, with that, I would... The committee to agree to add the additional goals since we voted um, the the first three goals. So we need um, approval from the full committee to add that additional goal. So I need a motion to add that fourth goal. Motion to approve the fourth goal. 
I have a motion by Dr. Horak. Second. A second by Ms. Tuffy. Uh, sorry, before I did that, are there any questions on what the goal itself for discussion? No, it's pretty straightforward. I just want to make sure that no one had questions before I went on. Um, okay, so we have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That was unanimous. Uh, are there any questions or comments about the process or about the forms themselves? Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Ms. Tuffy. Uh, so I gave everybody a copy of the draft for uh, the formative assessment checklist. Um, it's um, um, it's kind of he is going to uh, get the final version, a copy to each person, and you should be able to just type your responses right in on Google Docs, or you can either, or you can print it out and then um, share it with Ms. Heger, and then she'll combine the um, responses uh, to give a, a final report on the uh, formative assessment at the end of March. Right. Uh, and then the summative assessment will be in September after after we receive, uh, we wait, we wanted to wait until okay. the MCAS scores were in. For so once I collect everybody's um, feedback, I will share it back out with the committee before we actually discuss in an open meeting. So in case there's any questions or if I omitted anybody's comments or our feedback. So I will share that back out to the committee before um, we discuss it in an open meeting. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Maybe a question. So, so essentially the, the members of the committee will fill out this form after meeting with uh, Mr. Lee, and then you're going to assemble all the information into one document that has everyone's what, what everyone, uh, rate, how, how everyone rated uh, each standard. Yes, I'll summarize into one. Yes. Okay. Okay. And is that made publicly available? I will share it with the committee prior to, and we will discuss it in an open meeting on the 25th. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. So, um, oh, just question. Um, sure. When do you want our feedback to you? Well, again, it's sensitively March 25th, as long as everybody has the time to have a one on one with the superintendent between now and then and can get me the information. So, ideally, before the packet goes out, when does the packet go out for the 25th? Would be the previous Thursday? It's Thursday. So, the 21st. So, maybe the 20th. Did people have enough time to to meet with the superintendent one on one in the next ten days or so? Nine days? It's a it's a tight window. So I I think it's a tight window, and I'm going to say I would like an extra week because knowing that we want to get the information to you by before the packet goes out. Um, um, can I suggest April first meeting? Certainly. Anybody post it? April first, so it gives everyone an extra week. I would agree. Good. Okay. So then April first would be the meeting, so the deadline would be the previous Tuesday. Okay. Which would Thursday. be well Thursday for the for the packet, but I need to get the information, summarize, and turn it around. We have Good Friday, so I have to post it even before. So okay. so kind of went post on Wednesday. I wonder, can someone give me a date? Monday. So Monday. Twenty fifth. The 26th, it's Tuesday. Tuesday the 26th. Does that sound reasonable to everybody? Is that reasonable? Yes. All right. So the deadline to everybody to meet with the superintendent uh, and then get their um, forms to me by Tuesday, 25th. 26th. Excuse me. Thank you. The 26th. Tuesday the 26th. Great. Thank you. Any other questions on the evaluation? Some informative evaluation? Seeing none. Okay. All right. Um, we are moving on to policy and education. Ms. Tuffy. Thank you. So the policy and education second met on February 27th. Um, we were joined by members of the GEM Club and their advisors, Melissa Heller and Vivi Pierce, and officers Stephanie Snyder and Joella and Match, yeah, is it? Um, and uh, they spoke to the committee about 
uh, the available availability of menstrual products at Brantry High School. Um, they, I, I would like to commend them for um, doing such a good job and and sharing information with us. They did through student surveys. They identified the inaccessibility of menstrual products at BH. BHS is impacting the majority of female students and faculty. Um, they contacted a company called Bigal, which has developed um, a product called Pads in, on a Roll. Uh, the company will install the pad rolls in student bathrooms for a free three month trial. And then if that trial is success, successful, uh, it's hoped that this will be implemented at both high school and the middle schools next year. So um, I, I would like to uh, commend uh, all the members of the GEM Club for a really terrific presentation and um, addressing an issue that's important uh, to high school students and staff. Uh, second on our agenda was uh, was consideration of the Student Opportunity Act plan. Ms. Vernaza shared Braintree's three-year plan with the committee and it has to be submitted to DESE by April 1st. Um, uh, a copy was in everybody's binder. Did, did you want to speak to that or do you want me to just summarize it? I can do it. You want? Um, the Student Opportunity Act is a plan that every district is asked to submit to DESE. Um, to specifically identify subgroups um, that we see need extra support and um, that are not making the same progress as others. So um, as we did a deep data dive, as we always do, um, and we identified special education students, low-income students, and African-American Black students as the three subgroups that um, form consistently below average um, and especially students with disabilities, as Dr. Horak um, identified at our data meeting um, a couple weeks ago. So this, the plan allows us to um, give an explanation of the data, give some comparison of um, what we're seeing in terms of the student growth for each of these subgroups, um, and then our plan moving forward to identify specific interventions and supports to hopefully um, really focus in on those groups. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The subcommittee looked at uh, three policies for first reading. Policies KI and IHBAA provide guidelines to visitors to the schools um, and um, guidelines for observations of special education programs. Uh, both include an ob observation agreement to be signed by parents or guard guardians or by uh, a representative designated by the parent or guardian. And um, policy IJNDB, use of technology and instruction, updates the current network and technology uh, responsible use policy. Uh, that we have currently by adding uh, the purpose section from the 2023 MASC update and revising the language to make it gender neutral. Are there any questions about those policies that were in the packet? So those were for our first reading. Uh, we also talked about, uh, uh, Ms. Renaza shared us a draft Ms. Renaza shared a draft for an AI policy with the subcommittee. Um, and um, we uh, tabled that until the next meeting to give members more time to uh, study it uh, more thoroughly. And uh, I also gave a legislative update. Uh, the subcommittee discuss legislation that would provide grants to districts to provide tuition free full day kindergarten. Uh, this legislation, since our meeting has been combined into a 
Omnibus Early Education Funding Bill S-2697, which will be debated by Massachusetts Senate on Thursday. Um, I, as legislative liaison, I have written to both Senator Tillenty and Senator Keenan to ask that the grants for tuition-free kindergarten, full-day kindergarten be included in the final draft of the uh, early education funding bill. So those who are first reading um, policies, and we, had a no we have a number of uh, policies for second reading um, that we um, should vote on this evening. Those were all policies recommended by the Mass, Mass Association of School Committees uh, to update technology. Um, the first is BHE, the use of electronic messaging by school committee members. Second is EHAA, district security relating to technology. Third, EHB, data and data and records retention. Fourth, GBEE, personnel use of technology. Uh, fifth, IJND, access to digital resources. Um, six, JICJ, student use of technology in school. Uh, seven, KDC, community use of digital resources. And finally, KDCB, district website and social media. Um, have we uh, made any progress with the, um, the school committee Facebook page? It's, it's well, not you're right because. Facebook is a massive entity and trying to work through them. It's over there in the corner has been working on it since we brought this up and continues to work on it. Uh, it is not a simple task given the, who owns the page and Facebook's policies related to that. It's who, it, so it says the only administration, administrators they bring to public schools. But it was, when it was designed many years ago, it was given to individuals on the school committee who are no longer present by people who no longer work here. So we don't have a lot of the passwords. We don't not to go too deeply into something I'm going to speak ignorantly about. We are truly working on the issue, but we are running up against a bunch of obstacles because of the way it was initially created. Are, are we, as, as can we uh, delete or post on it? We don't have access to it. No access at all. Okay. All right. But truly, we have no working on it. We wouldn't find an answer. We just do not have one yet. Uh, are there any other questions about these policies that um, occur second reading? They're all, they all have to do with technology. Uh, Mr. Pogan. Thank you. Uh, so... The question about the uh, policy and use of technology and instruction. Yes. Is that okay? So that was one of the policies that was for first reading, right? And we it was it was grouped with these policies that uh, we're doing for a second reading. But initially, we thought it was okay the way it was, and then we took a, a second look at it. We noticed that uh, it didn't have. General gender neutral vocabulary in it. And so we wanted to um, yes. and, um, and make sure all the pronouns were gender neutral. And uh, we also added the purpose section from MASC. We had some discussion at the subcommittee about whether uh, we wanted to include the AI policy as part of that. Um, um, that policy, and after uh, at the next meeting, uh, we could let's talk about it. Uh, Mr. Lynch uh, suggested it would be better to have them as separate because AI is going to be uh, is changing so rapidly, and it and it's it's going to be an important part of um, instruction, and uh, so. Um, so that's 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 where we are. I'm sorry. Which one? Which policy was that you were uh, It's referring to the, um, the policy on use of technology and instruction. It's under 
consideration of first reading or approval is the fourth policy. Yeah. On the agenda. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I did have a uh, chair. Yes. I could just make a comment about that. Certainly. So the. Uh, this is on page two. It's unacceptable for users to use these resources for furthering any political or religious purpose. But um, aren't, aren't students allowed to do some political clubs, things like that? They would be allowed to form political clubs. We would be all inclusive in that regard. So if you wanted to start a Republican club and I want to start a Democrat club, both get you know acknowledged and, and brought on. So we have had some of those types of clubs in the past, but it is more about you can't go use our resources to plan your own political campaign, right? Or to you know go out and recruit or start a, a ministry within the school, right? You you can there are other ways you could probably go about that, but you can't use our network, you can't use our copiers, you can't use our paper, those types of restrictions. Of course. Okay. That's, that's uh, would it be possible to get a copy of the draft AI policy for the entire committee before coming out of the subcommittee? I would just be curious to see what the draft looks like. I think like. that would be a good idea. Yeah. Um, Send it to everybody. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Thank you. Any other questions? So we are looking for a motion to, uh, uh, can we do one motion to approve all the uh, Policies for second reading or yes. Yes. Are you, are you making the motion? Dr. So moved. Like <laughs> second. I have a motion by Dr. Horak, second by Mr. Lynch. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you to the policy subcommittee for their work on all of these policies. And our next meeting will be on March 26 at 6 30 p.m. March 26. That's it. We should probably schedule a finance and operations meeting um, as well. Maybe before that, 5.30, if people have availability. Okay. Um, March 26th is Tuesday. Tuesday. It suggests a week earlier. <laughs> week earlier? What's the date the week earlier? Oh, sorry. sorry. I don't have a calendar in front of me. 19th. 19th? Um, 5.30 or 6. There's another. Availability on the 19th? Yeah. And do you have availability on I'm available on the 19th. Okay. Do you want to do both on the 19th? You could do. I have, uh, I have a. I have missed a couple words, not available on the next. Okay. So we decided to have so we'll, six. So we'll do finance and operations on March 19th at 5 30. Okay. I was trying to piggyback on the same time, but if, yeah. you, if people aren't available and we should meet sooner rather than later on finance and operations. 5 30. 5 30 on the 19th here. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. All right, uh, so moving into finance and operations subcommittee updates, um, we have not met. Um, so we'll move right into the FY25 budget update, and I'll turn it over to Mayor Joyce. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, I know we are all very anxious to get underway on the fiscal year uh, 25 budget. Um, we were happy to um, complete the appointment of our new finance director, Mr. Michael Esmond, who happens to be in the audience this evening. Um, so his first day was today. Um, and he is quickly getting caught up to speed. So we do hope to sort of work through um, the um, sort of setting the stage to move into bu uh, budget season. With that being said, um, we, um, we know everyone's anxious uh, to get underway. And I wanted to share this evening, um, the superintendent will be sharing um, an updated slide on the budget, but this is just sort of the start of what we're talking about. But I wanted to share for the record this evening with all of you, and we um, are happy to enter into the minutes but the guidance that the mayor's office has provided to all department um, heads as we move into budget season. So I'm just going to read that to share for perspective what we're looking at. Um, as you may be aware or may not be aware, under the town charter, the mayor's budget submission is required to be delivered to the Braintree Town Council no later than 60 days prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. 
The adopted fiscal year 24 operating budget, um, as you may recall, relied on $4.3 million in non-reoccurring non resources, um, which was free cash, while supporting roughly 5% growth in spending, which are largely ongoing expenses. So we used a, a non-reoccurring revenue source for um, ongoing expenses. Furthermore, the fiscal year 24 budget was understated by approximately $2.6 million, primarily due to public safety overtime and utilities for the New South Junior High that were not part of um, the budget originally. Combining the fiscal year 24 budget deficit of $4.3 million and the unbudgeted fiscal year 24 spending of $2.6 million means that the town's embedded annual deficit for fiscal year 24 will be approximately $6.9 million. To add more context, our town's projected fiscal year 25 revenue increase will be about $3.2 million or 2.1%. If we do not spend one more incremental dollar in fiscal year 25 and fiscal year 26, it will take 2.2 years to bring the town into a break-even status. Um, we have certainly seen sluggish new revenue resources and we continue to see expenses climb. And with that being said, we have asked all departments to provide us with a budget um, to start the conversation on what it looks like to see what um, we can afford going into fiscal year 25. Um, so with that, um, I think uh, the superintendent is able to share some preliminary numbers, um, but this is kicking off what will be a very busy um, budgeting session over the next couple of weeks as we sort of look at all departments and what our resources are able to provide. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I, along with the Mayor's comments, uh, what we have been asked to produce is a level funded budget. A level funded budget for the school system represents $75.5 million. That is our budget this year. So this has no additional uh, monies in it over this year, going into next year. Uh, as you may recall, the initial budget that we put on the table uh, earlier this fall was uh, $85 million. That was to maintain all the services and all the programming that we had. Uh, through some work through the business office, Ms. Kaufman was able to update that initial budget ask down to $83.5 million. That, um, was really a result of some sped savings that we realized. So it, it's simple math, folks, that the, the gap that we would need to close uh, from the 83.5 million we were looking at for a level services budget to the 75.5 million dollars that would be a level funded budget is $8 million. Uh, that is a staggering figure for our system. Um, if we need to realize all of those savings, it will radically shift uh, everything that we do and how we do it. Uh, we have begun the work, but there's a lot of communication that has to occur as we get down to a number uh, that small relative to our need. Uh, we have already begun meeting with the leadership team, um, but as you also may recall, 84% of our budget is people. Uh, and so to be respectful in the process, we need to make sure that we're communicating uh, effectively with those individuals who may actually be affected by a reduction. Uh, and that is work that will be ongoing. So my, my hope is to come back on the 18th with greater detail and, and begin that process. Um, but, you know, the high level look that you're receiving this evening is because we have been unable to really talk to anybody who might actually uh, suffer the consequences of a reduction. And we, to be respectful, we want to get in front of that. So this is where we are today. Um, we Again, we've begun the work. Uh, both on the 18th and the 25th, uh, we'll come back with greater and greater detail uh, as we move through this process. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions from the committee? Dr. Horak. That's a big number. Um, would you be able to um, talk a little bit about whether you would be, what your vision would be for closing this gap? Like, for instance, would it be the elimination of, say, specials like gym, music, art, and elementary, like targeted elimination of programs? Or would you have envisioned um, reduction in staff and services um, all across the budget for all programs? Uh, that number is a very large number, so everything is on the table. 
Um, you know, there needs to be conversations about our relationship with the MSBA and the potential impact of that. Uh, but it's people. And so if it's class size or programming, at the end of it, it, it really is a reduction in people and staff. And you can see some other communities nearby that have truly begun to struggle with the, the lack of people that they have in large schools and the issues that come along with that. Uh, so we need to be thoughtful in terms of what we present to you. Uh, and all this week, there are meetings with um, various principals and various department uh, directors to, to make sure that we understand the impact before we put anything on the table for real. But no matter what that looks like, it's going to involve a lot of people. Okay, so a lot of people will be impacted negatively with their jobs. And so it sounds to me like you, you're you not able to give a vision yet of whether it'll be targeted programs or um staffing at, at all levels, at all grades? I, I wouldn't commit to anything at this point, you know, but I'll use your example as an example. So if you eliminated specials within the elementary level, well, that's a contractual issue for us because we guarantee prep time at, at the elementary level. So how would we cover those classes? So those are conversations we have to have to make sure that we could even pull it off if that's the direction we want it to take. And every single decision has qualifications such as that, that we need to fully understand the impact before we come to you or an impacted individual to say, this is what we're thinking about building. So that that is work in progress. We'll continue that work. And again, when we come to you with detail, it, it will be because we've vetted it and we have a firm understanding of what the impact will be. Thank you. Mustafa. So uh, to my memory, whenever we were faced with an issue like this in the past, um, class size increased and they reduced staff in that manner by combining classes. Um, it is, as a former teacher, I can tell you, it is extremely difficult to give students attention. Uh, if you have a class of 30, uh, I've had classes of 32, it is, it's tough to give kids the uh, extra help or, or even notice uh, if someone is struggling when you uh, have so many children to manage. So I hope that we will give all solutions um, a, a really um, thorough uh, investigation because this is not, not a good scenario for our students or our staff. And it's not a good scenario for Braintree as a whole. Um, I know I moved to Braintree many years ago because uh, of the reputation of the schools. And um, I, I would like to see uh, Braintree continue to have a strong school system. Thank you. Uh Mr. Lee, uh, ever, in a recent meeting, you had mentioned redistricting of elementary schools as a possible way to you know, save save money or cut cut costs. Is that something that could be implemented for the fiscal year twenty five? It can. Okay. And you know, when people talk about redistricting, they're really talking about reducing staff. That's what redistricting accomplishes. You become more efficient in terms of delivering uh, student services to a group of kids if you can spread it out. So at the end of the story, though, redistricting just means that we eliminated a certain amount of teaching positions, which is where the savings would be from a financial standpoint. So I can't emphasize enough that 85% of these decisions are going to be directly related to somebody's position and somebody's job and the impact in the classroom or for services that go along with the elimination of such a position. So, you know, part of our task is to make sure this committee understands fully what the impact will be uh, as we present scenarios and options that we consider that might get us to a number that the town can support. Sorella. Like at a later date, not tonight, I'm not gonna ask you to shoot from the hip on this, but are you able to give a tangible number to positions that would be lost? I mean, I think that's a valuable thing when we're talking about I mean, we're ultimately dealing with a math problem where like town revenue grows at three, 4% and school budget is growing by 
what, like 20 in the last two years? Oh, this year in particular, uh, even at the 83 and a half, that's about an 11 and a half percent increase of existing. So it is an extraordinary year. We are not alone. You yeah. look around, you can see other communities going through the same thing. So the increase that we need is larger than normal. Yeah. Um, but the, the revenue stream is what it is as well. So those two things don't really. I think a, a tangible number, I think just for the voters, right, to see because there are obviously solutions and overrides a dirty word in Braintree, but like to see a number, I think would be a good thing for people to, to be able to make a decision on basically. Our goal is between now and the 25th is to present you with exactly what you're asking for. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Through the mayor, uh, through the uh, chair. Yes. I have a question Sorry. for the mayor. Um, so, um, It seems as if development in Braintree has been particularly lagging behind surrounding communities. Uh, we have a proposed development at St. Thomas Moore. Um, um, and I'm sure there are other, other um, proposals in the pipeline. What kind of revenue would that bring into the town for FY25 if it were, if it were to be accepted? There's the thing, there's the... Uh, uh, Chick Fil A and Bank at the at the Rotary. Sure, um, I can speak um, broad picture without specific numbers and timing, but I will say with regards to development, there's some baseline development in our estimates for new growth and new development that includes projects like that. So, to the extent that we have enough to put us over our anticipated new growth numbers, which has not been the case the last couple years, um, those projects while they have an opportunity to realize um, order of magnitude, the couple of projects we have in the pipeline are not gonna hit this number um, and especially not for fiscal year 25. Any other questions or comments from the committee? All right, we are meeting on March 18th, March 25th, April 1st, April 8th. So we will be having meetings and this will be obviously the topic of conversation. Um, our public hearing, where uh, we open up the public comment, it will be April 8th. Um, and then we can either vote that if we're comfortable, depending on where the numbers are on April 8th, we will vote. Um, there are 10 articles that we vote for, and then uh, the bottom line of the budget. Um, if we do not vote on the 8th, then we will vote on the 22nd. As the mayor indicated, I believe she has to have her budget done by May 1st. Is that 60 days prior to the end of um, the fiscal year? So... To, to Mr. Lee's point, we will hopefully have more detail. We will have more detail, definitely. I shouldn't say hopefully. We will have more detail on March 18th. Um, and again, we'll be meeting on a weekly basis from now until the budget is approved. So um, this is a daunting task. Um, it's very worrisome and all the points that you know the committee has brought up. Um, you know, this, is, this could be potentially very deep cuts into the Branch Public Schools. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. A motion, Ms. Horak, and a second by Ms. Tuffy. Mr. Fogarty. Hi. Uh, hi. Hello. Mayor Joyce. Hi. Dr. Horak. Hi. Ms. Tuffy. Mr. Lynch. Hi. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned.